we are going to wrap up unit six definite integrals with two theorems one of these theorems is my favorite because i'm a visual learner and it really connects the idea with what i'm finding mathematically with um, the visual representation the other rule is my favorite because it's quick <laughs> um, and pretty easy to do so that's always a favorite too all right so let's start out with an idea so i'm going to walk you through this so let's say we have some function and I wanna find the integral value from zero to two. So I've got, um, we're gonna make our function all above the axis so we don't have to worry about net area and it's always gonna be positive. So we've got this curvy region here. Well, if I wanna find the integral value and I'm not given the function, I need to find its area somehow. Well, the only idea that we've learned are geometric shapes. So let's talk about a rectangle. So if I want to find that same area, I can go from zero to two and draw a rectangle because that's length times width. The problem is, is I'm forgetting about all of that area. And so our integral value is going to be a complete underestimate. And so it's not very useful. So let's try a different shape or idea geometrically. We can still span from zero to two, but let's use the entire height. Okay, and so I really have all of this area that is in my integral value that I don't want. And so this is going to be an overestimate. Okay, and so that's, it's almost double. That's not very accurate if you're a mathematician. Okay, so there's got to be a way I can find using geometric shapes like a rectangle, I can find that exact area because um, two different objects can have the same area and be completely different shapes. Logically, that's got to make sense. So what happens is we can, let's say we span from zero to two, but if I start drawing my rectangle up, I've got this extra area, so I don't want to go all the way up because I want these to balance. So I'm just going to go a little bit up, and I'm not even going to say halfway um, because I doubt it's ever going to be that nice, but we know it's somewhere in between um, zero and almost five. Okay. So if we think of how would we find that area, we've got area equals length times width. My area value will be equivalent to the integral value exact. So the length is going to be um, 0 minus 2, so 2, too long. And my width is going to be this height. Well, I don't really know how tall it is, but I know the height is actually touching my curve. So remember, the height is going to be the f of c value. Now, instead of just saying 2, because we, can, we want to represent this in general, I can get 2 by my limits were a to b. So two would be represented as B minus A. So what we end up with is that the integral value from zero to two F of DX can be found by using B minus A times F of C. All right. So as long as we can find that information, we would be able to use our geometric area to find the exact curved area. All right. That is the idea behind the mean value theorem. So mean, you know, is another word for average. So some people call this the average value theorem. Um, it really is the MVT theorem for integrals. The mean value theorem for derivatives did something totally different. So on our applications, it might say find the average temperature. So remember, you'll add up all the rates of change of temperature. And to average, aren't I adding things up and dividing by them? This formula doesn't look like we're dividing by anything. So let's manipulate it, okay? Because I don't even memorize this formula. Now, B minus A is a number. So if we divide both sides by B minus A, if we're allowed to do that, I would really end up with, I can factor that out, our limits, and that equals F of C. So remember, f of c was the height, and that is your average value. 
It's not when it occurred, but that is the average value. If you want to know when, and I'm going to put a little disclaimer here, if you want to know like when something occurred, you need to find X, which is really C, okay? So if I have the height, we wanna use the original function. Remember we can take, we can set F of X, our function equal to the average value and then solve for X or C. We say C because it's just a generic X value, but so keep that in mind. Do you want the average value or do you want to know when it occurred? Those are the two differences. And so now remember average means you add up a bunch of things. So add up a bunch of rates of change and divide by how many there were. That's really it. That's the whole concept of an average or a mean. And so that's why this format I memorize, one, because mathematically it's going to be the easiest for you to do. But it also gets you to remember, oh, average, it even looks like an average. I'm dividing by how many there are total and I'm adding a bunch of stuff up, okay? So it's my favorite because I can see the connections and it helps me remember when to do it and what I'm doing really, because mathematically you're just gonna get lost in why are we doing this? So this is the nicer version, but I do like to take the time kind of prove this concept to you and this formula. Okay, that's it. It works for any shapes. It even works if your area was some above and some below. So you don't even have to worry about that, okay? Mathematically, it will work itself out. All right. So um, there will be problems on the homework that do require a graphing calculator. I don't yet have my um, online graphing calculator, so I'm going to do them. Then I want you to do them with me and then check your answer. Okay. So these problems, because they are averages and they, they'll give you a lot of functions that you can't integrate by hand. So as long as you know the formula to use, the AP exam says, go ahead, use it. The calculator will never tell you to do the average or how to do the average if you don't know what you're looking for. So that's the idea. You're only going to be using the graphing calculator to integrate. So on paper, you'll set up your formula and then you just type it into a calculator. All right. So check with me. All right. So number one, um, and I'll probably, I don't know, we could do all of these with a calculator to check or not. So go ahead and we'll just double practice. So on example, first one, it says find the average value for our function on zero to two. So remember that's A and B. So what I want to do is set this up. So we want to go one over B minus A, the integral from A to B of our function dx. So if this was um, a more complicated function and this was a free response question, you need to show this formula for one point. And then you want to type that into your calculator to get the second point. Does that make sense? Now we can integrate this by hand, so I'll do it both ways on this one problem. So we get one half. I'm going to integrate with the power rule. This really just takes time. That's why the AP says, as long as you know to do this average, we'll let you go ahead and use a calculator usually. Um, from two to zero, I don't have to change my limits because they're in terms of X. So I get one half F of two minus F of zero. So when I plug in two, eight thirds plus two minus zero plus zero, so what's that? Six thirds. So I get one half times 14 thirds, which is seven thirds. Okay. So this one we can do by hand. Now, what I want you to do is I have a graphing calculator and I know you can't see it, but I am going to just type this part into Y1. 
So I don't do the whole thing. So in Y1, I'm going to type in X squared plus 1. Okay, so go ahead and do that with me. You can pause me if you need to go get your calculator. So X squared plus 1. And then hit the graph. So you can make sure you have the right graph. Okay, and so it should look like this. All right, next you're going to hit that blue second button, so second trace, so we can calculate, and we're going to go down to number seven, the integral. We want to integrate. And so it says lower limit. So remember, our lower limit is zero, so you can just type in zero and hit enter. And then it says upper limit, and we're going to type in two. And then it says this, f of x dx equals 4.666667. And that is just that red part. So then I need to get out of my graph, and we're just going to take half of that. So I'm just going to type in, remember, go to, um, I go to like five decimal places. So that way three are accurate. So 4.66667 divided by two, because it's half of that. So I got 2.333, because the AP wants three minimum. And so if I do seven divided by three, they match. Okay, so please make sure that you know how to type in integrals into your graphing calculator. And it's three decimal place accuracy on your answer, not before you're done. That's why I always go to more until I'm done, okay? If you're off, you get no point. So I really am picky about this. All right, um, let's try the next problem. So find the value of C guaranteed by the mean value theorem for integrals. So remember, the value of C is really when it happened. So it's an X value. That 7 thirds, that was the height of the rectangle, or that is the average value of the function. All right? So this is going to be different directions, but they both want you to use the first step the same. So we're going to do 1 over B minus A, the integral from 0 to 2. And I would still set it up. Okay, and let's act like we just did all that work by hand. So let's act like this was a calculator question. And so we ended up with 7 thirds. Um, if I didn't have 7 thirds, like 2.3333, I would write that as 2 and 1 third, which is 7 thirds. Because when you solve, you really want to solve exactly. Okay. So you get one point for the setup, one point for this answer, and then we're going to get one point for actually answering the question that they want. So remember, that's the y value of the function, which is x squared plus one. So we're gonna set x squared plus one, because this added up all the area, and we're gonna set it equal to the, the height, and solve. So subtract one, and so minus one, which is minus three thirds, which gives me four thirds and then take the square root. Now, technically when you take a square root, you get plus or minus, the square root of four is two, and the square root of three is just root three. There is no need to rationalize in calculus. The AP does not care. But you wanna remember your original domain restriction. So sometimes you'll have two answers, and then sometimes you'll only have one. So since we only care about the answer from zero to two, we want C equals two over root three, okay? And they would only have you find this value if you were integrating this by hand the whole way. So don't worry about like changing decimals to fractions and things like that. This would all be done by hand. All right, the last one, I just wanna make sure that we can do trig. So keep in mind your calculator needs to be in radians. So we're gonna go one over pi minus zero from zero to pi, and we wanna do sine. And so really what we're doing is we're finding the exact area from right here, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> so 
Uh, we don't need to do substitution. I know this is going to be negative cosine. So I get negative 1 over pi cosine from pi to 0. So negative 1 over pi. I always just factor this out. So cosine of pi minus cosine of 0. I don't skip this step writing them out. It's just too easy to make an error. Um, so the cosine of pi is, this is cosine, this is pi over 2, this is 0, and then this is pi. So the cosine of pi is negative 1 minus the cosine of 0 is 1. So I get negative 1 over pi times negative 2, so I get 2 over pi. That's a pretty nice answer for a really curvy area. Okay, and that's what they wanted. They wanted the average value. So that's the height of the rectangle. Now, notice if I was going from 0 to pi, my answer wasn't just right in the middle. So 2 over like 3.14 is a little bit less than 1. So that's 3.14. So we're looking at like right here. I had to draw my rectangle. That's really what we found. Does that make sense? At 1? Well, not 1. It's really 2 over pi. <laughs> so people think, oh, I'll just be in the middle. I mean, that's, that's not how curves work. So, all right. Next rule is the second TOC. Now, the second fundamental theorem of calculus, I kind of went through this on 6.2. Two, I believe, or 6.3, um, when we had to take the derivative of an integral, remember, we just end up with the derivative of the integral they were inverse functions, and so the derivative and the integral canceled out, and so we just ended up with our original function. Now, that concept is true, and that was before we reintroduced the whole idea of u-substitution. So if this was just a simple function like a power rule, then that would be great, okay? But we know that we can have more complex functions. And so we just have to kind of amend our thinking a little bit because we would have, have integrated with u substitution and then we would have done a derivative that involved a chain rule. And so this formula that we're gonna memorize takes all of that into consideration, okay? I could prove it to you, I'm just choosing not to since I proved the other function, and I want this to be less than 40 minutes. So what it says is we do have some conditions, and these are almost always met though, but if our function is continuous on the open interval from A to B, um, then when we take the derivative of an integral, we are going to get just that inside function. But what happens is you are going to substitute, and you'll see why, eventually, substitute the upper limit into the function. So let me erase this. And then you're going to multiply it by the derivative of the upper limit. See how it kind of like, even in the formula we memorize, it involves kind of doing a chain rule, derivative of the upper limit. And you might think, oh, that's silly. And then you're going to subtract off because we were still integrating. So see how it's combining both ideas. When we substitute the lower limit into the function, whatever they give you, and then we still have to multiply that by the derivative of the lower limit. Now, I know you probably have a bunch of questions, and I always had like confused looks on my face like, I don't really even think I have to do that, Mrs. Eden. I bet I can find a shortcut. <laughs> and I'm sure some of you are thinking that right now. And I promise you, you might be able to find a shortcut for 98% of the problems that you're given, okay? But you know us teachers are tricky and we are sneaky and we already know how to trap you. And so what happens is you're gonna be given some different problems like my second one, my third one, and then we're gonna catch you. Because these would be all right or all wrong 
it would be worth one point. So it's not like I would be looking at your work because there really isn't much work to show. So if you're trying to find a shorter shortcut, there isn't one. Please do this. It literally is one of the most missed concepts on the AP exam. And in my classroom, I, I these were the notes I used. I told them you're gonna miss this on my test. And they did because they really just did not believe they needed to do the whole entire formula. Okay, so I will do the same instruction and I just hope that you're listening to me. But so let's look at my first example. This is not a trap. You might be like, oh my gosh, see, I told you I didn't have to do all this work. So what we notice, and these questions aren't going to be super tricky to notice. You're going to see it written as the derivative of the integral. Um, probably 90% of the time. Okay. So I notice, oh, those cancel out. They're inverse operations. So then I say, okay, I need to plug in f of x times, and I write it as the d derivative of x minus plug in one times the derivative of one. Like this is for me to write it out because I know like, oh, I'll forget to do it. Like if I don't write it out. So when I plug in x, I literally mean, notice how this has an x variable and our variable in the function is t, and that's on purpose, okay? So it won't ever be an x that you're plugging into an x. That's just awkward. So, but they're both variables because of this right here. So if I plug in x, I really do just replace the t with an x. You're not integrating anything. Okay, it really is just function substitution because we would have integrated and then we would have taken the derivative. Now, I actually can't integrate this function. That's why they pick this because they don't want you to do this by hand. All right, it's not possible. So the derivative of x is one. Now I'm gonna plug in one. So I get root one squared is one minus one, which is zero. And I'll worry about that in a second. And the derivative of one is zero. So that whole term does wipe out. So you just end up with x squared minus one. And so that's why people say, oh, so I just have to plug in the letter and I'm done? Sometimes. All right. So let's try another one. So we've got the derivative of x. So notice x is right there of this function t times sine of t. So once again, this we can't even integrate with u substitution, but t is the variable on this inside function. So we notice those cancel. So I do f of, we're gonna plug in the upper limit times the derivative of the upper limit minus plug in the lower limit x times the derivative of x. So I kind of made this dx notation up in d5 um, just to kind of help me and students. So I'm going to take five and I really plug that in everywhere I see a variable. So we get five times the sine of five and that's five radians. And then times the derivative of five is zero. And so yeah, that does wipe out all of those values because they're all numerical. Minus, if I plug in x, I get x times sine of x, and the derivative of x is 1. And so I really do end up with negative x sine x. And so if you weren't doing the whole process, you might end up with a 5. They'll have positive x sine x as an answer. Um, there'll be lots of things. They'll even say not possible because some people get confused with the x and the t. All right, the last problem kind of disguises this concept. So this is how you'll see it. So they will define, they'll say, hey, let big F be the integral. And so that should make sense because, oh, yeah, big F was reserved for the original function after I integrated. So then it says, then evaluate F prime. So what I do, if you're not sure, because, you know, we mix everything together, is if I want to take the derivative, then that means I need to take the derivative of this. And so that's why, even though it looks like a different problem, it really is the same concept if you understand the notation and relationships. So then I say, oh, well, that's really no different. So I'm gonna plug in x squared 
times the derivative of x squared minus plug in 2 times the derivative of 2. So I only have one place to plug in x squared. So I get 3x squared squared is x to the 4th. So I get 3x to the 4th plus 5. And the derivative of x squared is 2x. So I do put that in parentheses because remember we will have to distribute. Now, f of 2. So I can plug in 2 for my variable. And I just say I get 3 times 2 squared plus 5. You can even do it this way. Times the derivative of 2 is 0. So sometimes I'll even write like, who cares? And students think that's funny. <laughs> but so I really do need to distribute because that would be the answer. So we get 6x to the 5th plus 10x. And they might leave their answer in factored form, although they usually don't because that's kind of a big giveaway. All right, so I think problem two and three would be traps, but different reasons. I think the notation on the third one and maybe the letters or using the formula on the second one. The last question, I want to go ahead and use your graphing calculator. This is kind of like a free response question. So notice I have some um, on here for you to choose. Okay. Uh, the only one that I want you to pick one on is these two. I don't think you need to do both. They're very similar. So uh, they give you people entering the line for an escalator at a rate modeled by R. So if this is a rate, that means this is a derivative. So rate derivative. I like to make a note of that. And these are domain restrictions. So this would be people. We've got from 0 to 300 people and then 0 for more than 300 people. Okay. So people per second and T is in seconds. Oops. Not people. Sorry. Seconds. Not people. I should read ahead. So as people get on the escalator, they exit the line at a constant rate of 0.7 meters per second. There are 20 people in line at t equals zero. So this is my initial value. So we know, I always like to write it, um, there are 20 people. Initial value, no initial value. Because we need to take that into consideration since these are people getting on and off an ex escalator. <laughs> So we will need a graphing calculator for this problem because of the function they give. Uh, we won't be able to really take the derivative or integrate that by hand quickly. Um, so uh, for part A, it says, how many people enter the line for the escalator during the time 0 to 300? Um, and so because this is a graphing calculator question, I think this was asked in like 2019 on the real AP exam. You just need to show your setup. All right, so if I want to know how many people enter, then I don't care about the 20 people that start on it. I need to know how many are coming because that's the rate. So we want to go from 0 to 300 of our function. And you can even write r of t, okay? And so this would be worth one point. Now, to integrate that, you're going to need to get out your graphing calculator. So remember, in y1, you want to type in this big long function. So I'm going to go ahead and do it with you. All right, so uh, just make sure you use parentheses. 44, uh, use X instead of T. I know there is a T on your calculator, but um, it doesn't really register. Okay, so I ended up with 270 people. Okay, if you graph this, remember you should, um, you'd have to change your window to see 0 to 300, but it should be this little curvy region. Okay, that's what we're finding. All right, so for part B, it says during the time interval from 0 to 300 seconds, there are always people in line for the escalator. How many people are in line at time t equals 300? So really the whole concept is the number of people is we want to think of the initial population 
or people, and then add on the accumulated. Accum if I could spell accumulated people. Okay, and this concept works a lot um, with bananas or anything or how many you're taking off. But since we're doing the integral value, I don't have to worry about how many people they're leaving. Sometimes you'll be given two functions. We saw that with the banana problem where some bananas were being put on and some bananas were being put off and they were different functions. So um, my initial population, so we've got from zero to 300. Actually, I'm not even going to write that. We've got um, 20 people. And then we want to add on from 0 to 300 of when we accumulate, we've got the people that are coming on. So let's back up for a second. We've got the entering minus, we don't have an equation for how many people are leaving, but remember, it does say that we exit the line at a constant rate of 0.7 people per second. So because I'm going from zero to 300 seconds, I've got the equation, which is R, and we also know it's leaving for each of those seconds, so that's the only reason why we can put these together at 0.7. And that's with DT. Okay. So we did need to use that information. But we're going to go ahead and because we're integrating, I can do, I'll keep the 20. And I'm going to do this kind of separately. So we've got because that R I already have in my calculator. We know this is zero to 300 of R of T. And remember, I can integrate this separately. So minus from zero to 300 of 0.7. And I'm really only splitting them up because we already know this R of T function. We did that in part A, all right? So mathematically, I've got 20 plus that 270, and then minus, well remember this is just like length times width, or you can integrate that on a calculator. So I've got 0. 0.7 times 300, and let me go ahead and do that. So 0. 0.7 times 300 is 210. So, uh, 20 plus 270 is 290, minus 210 is 80, okay? So how many people are in line? And so I say equals 80 people are in line. Um, are in line at T equals 300, because we accounted for how many started, how many came, and how many got, exited all in that whole time. All right, so that's about as much work as you need to show if you're given a calculator question, but make sure you show your equations, okay? All right, go ahead and give your student practice a try. I do have similar problems that do need a graphing calculator on them, okay? All right, so good luck.